Hello, I'm Anne Morrison and I'm here today on behalf of the Irish Cultural Centre in Hammersmith, London. Uh, one of the things that the ICC does is to provide a platform for Irish authors to launch and promote and to discuss their work. Its first literary festival in autumn 2020 showcased Irish writers from all over Ireland, as well as Canada and America. And today's session is part of a slightly shorter series focusing specifically on leading voices and writers from Northern Ireland. And so today I am delighted to be in conversation with Frank Ormsby. Uh, Frank was born in rural County Fermanagh and grew up in a house with no running water or electricity, but has become one of the towering figures of Irish literature. He was appointed Ireland Professor of Poetry for three years from 2019. He's published seven books of poetry so far and has won several awards. He's also had an important role in shaping and curating the work of other poets, both through The Honest Ulsterman, which he edited from 1969 to 1989, and through editing many anthologies and collections. He's from a Catholic background, but for many years worked as head of English in one of Belfast's leading state schools, Royal Belfast Academical Institution, better known as INST. And uh, Frank, you and I have known each other for what, about 40 years or more? Yes, I think at least that. <laughs> <laughs> at least that, exactly. So, um, as I said, you're, you're currently Ireland Professor of Poetry, which for those who don't know uh, about it, is a bit like, like being the Poet Laureate, I guess, of, of Ireland. Uh, what does it mean to you to have been given that honour? Well, it's a kind of endorsement, you know, the, uh, you, you don't apply for this. Uh, a committee sits down and considers people who might fulfil this kind of task, and then it's offered to you. You're given the chance either to accept it or, uh, or, or not. Um, if you accept it, it, it covers three years, in the course of which you, you have a stint at Queen's University, one at Trinity College in Dublin and one at University College Dublin. So, some, and, and, and you get paid for it and so on. <laughs> it's, it's, Even better, yes. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a tremendously um, generous kind of uh, award, I think. Partly, I think it's an award for, for services to poetry, if that's not too... Uh, uh, pretentious phrase to describe it. I wanted to to talk as well about the fact that you've been very open about the fact that you were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease um, back in 2011 so you've been living with it for what 10 years now and you've written some absolutely brilliant poems about it. Um, how does it how do you find it affects you on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, uh, I first I became aware of it when I was diagnosed at, at a point after I had uh, retired, and uh, again there was the, the sort of the, the disappointment in a way of reaching retirement, looking forward to living the kind of retired life or at least a life of, of, with poetry, so to speak, you know, and uh, all of a sudden you discover that the as friends and companions, you are taking into your retirement Parkinson's disease, uh, diabetes, <laughs> in my case as well. Yeah. God, I've told them, though I don't actually believe that one. <laughs> um, so, I was the uh, typical person who taught for almost 40 years and never had a day's illness in his entire life, you know. <laughs> yeah. And it was all stacking up somewhere in the background and I didn't realise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you ask about the uh, everyday aspect of this. I mean, in a very general way, everything has slowed down, for example. I mean, I was a reasonably athletic person in my time, um, playing various sports and all the rest of it. I couldn't even think or dream about that now, you know. And uh, when I go out for a walk with Karen, we've reached a sort of um, agreement that she will simply walk on at her speed 
And then at some point ahead, she would turn and come back for me, as it were. And I, I will still be traveling, doing my snail's pace, Parkinson's walk. Doing your <laughs> own pace, yeah. Yes, at my own. So it's so everything, everything seems to have slowed down. Mm. Also, I find that I'm a tra- tremendously clumsy. And, uh, you know, this is uh, typical of Parkinson's that uh, you find difficulty lacing shoes, um, uh, buttoning shirts, or just ordinary simple things like that that, you, that you've always done in the course of the day. And suddenly it becomes half an hour or even sometimes an hour in the morning preparing yourself to, to face the day. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose that's the most uh, an important way in which it has changed my day day to day. Mm. Um, I still count myself lucky though. Know, um, I mean, I know people who have Parkinson's disease who uh, it's almost as if they expect to each, each morning when they wake up, they expect this might be their last day. And uh, I mean, I, I can understand that and I can sympathise with it, but I would find it very hard to approach it myself. I'm not kind of, I suppose this is one of the things that is good about having a sense of humour. <laughs> okay. Parkinson really tests your sense of humour. Yeah. It must do. And I mean, I'm, I'm interested in your attitude towards it, which you're talking about there, because in your poetry, there's kind of zero self-pity mm-hmm. um, about this and actually quite this quirky humor in your attitude uh, towards it, which is which is a very interesting sort of form of uh, resistance to it or, uh, you know, way of dealing with it. Yes, yes. And uh, one of the first things I did uh, when I was diagnosed was to go to the internet to see if there were any good jokes about Parkinson's. <laughs> there are some horrendous jokes about Parkinson, but there are some very witty ones as well. Tell us one. Well, my favourite was the one which, which would you prefer to be, or which would you prefer to have, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? And the answer is Parkinson's, because I would rather lose half my pint shaking. Uh, I'd rather do that than, than, than uh, wonder where I'd left it down. <laughs> See, the slowness is catching up with me there. I couldn't even tell a damn joke. <laughs> well, but we, well, it's still a good one. It's still a good one. Absolutely. So, but that's what I mean. Is that attitude, which is in the poetry as well, that uh, that really comes across um, in terms of the way you deal with it. And I was interested as well because the Parkinson poems, which came out as originally as a pamphlet, and they're now in the darkness of snow, that they were actually used as teaching aids by the. Um, nursing program at Queen Margaret's University at Edinburgh um, for the staff and the students because of their sort of profound insight into the condition. And I was wondering, when you were writing those poems, were you thinking that this is going to promote greater understanding of Parkinson's or was that just accidental? No, I, I, it, was a, it was a bit of a surprise when the professor that I was dealing with came up to me after the poetry reading and, and said that the uh, she thought her neurological classes would actually benefit by, uh, you know, having sessions with these uh, ones and, uh, and the, the kind of, she was particularly interested in uh, poetry as a sort of source of our expression of empathy. Yeah. You know, she, she thought of that as one of the most important things that uh, she was trying to teach to uh, trainee doctors and uh, nurses. I mean, doctors have to have maximum empathy, don't they? Because they often tell us some of the worst news we ever hear in our lives and how we're told as well as what the news is, is actually really important. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So Frank, I wonder if you would um, read one of the uh, Parkinson's poems for us, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, I'd like to do that. This one is called Adjutans, which was an earlier name for uh, Parkinson's disease. My left arm is jealous of my right, the one without a tremor. When right pours a glass of wine or throws a ball, 
left stifles a mild shiver of reproach. I call him Ajitans and let him take charge of the big jug of water so that the ice tumbles into the glasses like a subsiding glacier. He peaks in the football season when Arsenal play. If he get any better, I'll have to snuggle him tightly to my chest, straight jacket style. Meanwhile, his brother Wright is undeterred by his burgeoning duties, and once, once only, has released his own answering tremor. It's it's so you. It's kind of both. It's both chilling in its effect, but also it's got the humour there about you watching the Arsenal match and the the effect um, of that as well. So it's a it's a great poem. And. Um, can we, I want to take you back now, if you don't mind, to your kind of early life, because um, it's something that uh, you, you use quite a bit for your poetry and have done through, through the, the books and through the years. Um, and I was talking a bit earlier when I was introducing you about um, this very rural background you came from um, near Irvingstown and County Fermanagh. Um, I mean, I was wondering how much you feel you still are that lad from Irvingstown and, and how different you are now. Would he have been able to predict what, has ha what all has happened in the well, I, years? I don't know that I'm uh, all that uh, different, really. Although, I mean, I suppose when I think of a moment, uh, it's a place that I look back to because, you know, I've lived in Belfast since 1968 or thereabouts. And uh, trips to Fermanagh tend to be for marriages and funerals. You know, my brother and my sister have got quite large families. There's a yearly round of marriages. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I generally have to produce a list of nephews and nieces. <laughs> there are so many of them, like, I can't remember the names. And do you still feel connected to the place when you do go back then? I do, yes, I do feel connected. I think there are aspects of it that I appreciate from a distance more than I did when, uh, when, when I lived there. Um, but it was a, it's a very rich kind of seed ground, really, for poetry, I think. You know, it was the, 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 the qualities of the rural, the qualities of the countryside, the whole experience of helping on the farm, for example, we, we didn't have a, a farm, but uh, our neighbours and relatives did a uh, uh, tiny little place, 16 acres, I think it was. And um, we would have worked in the fields with them during the summer months. And my mother was a, it was a terrific sort of farm worker herself, was a her brother worked in the, the local meat uh, town castle. Um, he worked there, so she was more or less left at home to look after her parents and, and to do the work of the farm. And then she was absolutely terrific. I mean, great images of her leading, leading the donkey and cart, um, building hay, particularly that image of her, you know, the rock rising, up, rising around her. You know. And uh, her, her at home, she seemed to be uh, in that world, cutting turf, milking cows. I mean, she had all the skills that uh, somebody might have you know, for working on a farm. Mm. And uh, I mean, there, there, are, there, are, there are poems. There's one poem in particular called The Builder, which uh, is a sort of portrait of her building hay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and I'm wondering where this <clears throat> love of literature uh, with you came from, because you, there wasn't a particularly literary household, was it? No, no, it def definitely wasn't a bookish uh, household. My father and mother both left school when they were 11. Um, my father immediately went to, to work on a, a neighbouring farm. Uh, and uh, so they, they weren't they weren't literary people in any sort of way at all. Um, in fact, I would say that up to a point, my father was probably a bit hostile towards the whole idea of, you know, a, a member of the family going to a grammar school and being educated beyond 
you know, the country folk level. Um, you, have, you have an interesting relationship with your father, which, you know, sort of reading the poems, your attitude uh, to him, you think you call him a blunderbuss in, in an early poem and so on. Has, has your attitude changed to him over the years? I think it probably has. Um, my father appears in every book that, that I've written, you know. The, the ghost is hanging about all the time, waiting to be a clear bit, you know. <laughs> Um, he, my mother, I, I think I've probably under, undersold her in, in the poetry, although uh, a number of what I think of as my better poems are about her, um, and uh, the fact that she worked away behind the scenes, as it were, and encouraging me uh, when she, when she went to a local auction, if there were, if there were books for sale, she, she generally uh, bought some and brought them home to me because she, although uninterested in books herself, she nevertheless had a very strong sense of the hunger that I had for, uh, for books. Shall we move on, Frank, to, to um, influences that, that you had? Because you left Fermanagh, you moved up to Belfast and suddenly you were in a different kind of literary world. I mean, which, which were the writers, Northern Irish writers in particular, that had an influence on you at that, at that time? Well, um, I really started to write when I was about 10 or 11 years old, which is just before I went to grammar uh, school. And, uh, I think the incentive was a competition in, in, uh, in a skill and show. Uh, and we were encouraged to enter for the poetry competition. <laughs> uh, and I, I remember uh, I wrote a poem which was about uh, a fight between two dogs. It was an exciting poem in which two dogs <laughs> tore it out to pieces. <laughs> uh, and it won second prize. Uh, I wonder uh, what happened to the person who came first, yeah. I actually think I know the person who came first. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh dear, I think, yeah, <clears throat> you'd have given him some competition there. Uh, so, uh, so I think that there was, uh, there was a sort of satis satisfaction of winning, I suppose. But I think in addition to that, I, there must have been something about the whole, the whole act of writing. Um, using rhyme, having difficulty, you know, keeping the, the right number of syllables in each line, and then I feel a great sense of satisfaction when the I actually get when it turned out uh, all right. And just the whole musicality of it, you know, and and uh, and the, the way in which poems were structured. So I think in some sort of way, when, when I was introduced to that or found out about that, it, it, it exerted an enormous kind of uh, appeal, and that in no time at all I was writing little notebooks full of uh, poems, very often in imitation of the patriotic verse that used to appear in a magazine called Iron Zone. Iron Zone, I've been amazed to find out, is still on the go. At, at one point, they published a sort of a, a section in the middle on green paper in which they, um, there's a couple of pages of poetry, mainly sentimental sort of poetic verse by the, the Young Ireland Movement and Thomas Moore and people like that. But I've often thought that the real influence of that must have been, um, you know, that it, from an early age, it had me actually shaping poems, you know. It wasn't that any kind of loose uh, free verse or anything like that. You were using really strict things like forms like uh, um, rhyming couplets, quatrains, and you know that that became a sort of a natural thing. It would be a great terrific irony, wouldn't it, if uh, it turned out that one of the biggest influences on the poets who emerged in the north in the, in the late sixties were all more or less influenced by the poems in 
periodic stuff like that and the poems and the English schools and anthology. <laughs> there's, a, there's a PhD thesis waiting to be written to the right there, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, you I, moved up, I'm, I'm interested in what um, happened when you moved up to, to Belfast and to Queens and the people that you met there and that um, very sort of vibrant poetic scene that there was at that time that you moved into? Yeah. Uh, when I was doing my A-levels in Irvingstown, um, a local teacher came up to me one day and said, um, you're interested in writing, you want to be a poet. Go to Dublin, because Dublin is the literary capital of Ireland. Um, I didn't go to Dublin, I went to Belfast because it was nearer home, never been away from home. Uh, it was a place that you could hitchhike home from uh, every Saturday, which I used to do. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't thinking very much about Dublin and its literary history. But the terrific thing was, the irony of that ad advice, because in fact, I couldn't have gone to a better place for an aspiring poet. It was 1966. It was the year when Death of a Naturalist appeared. Uh, when I went to the English department up to Queen's, Heaney was one of my tutors and lecturers. Um, and the, my first poem appeared in a magazine called The Honest Ulstermann, which later I was to uh, edit. Um, it was uh, the, uh, the editor who accepted it, Jim Simmons, said that the poem was a pastiche of Heaney. He was dead on. It was an absolutely spot on description of the poem. Uh, but he said he liked it enough to publish it, so it appeared. And Heaney took me aside after a tutorial and said how much he liked the poem. Invited me for coffee and my student Jimmy. And as we were going up the steps, somebody hailed him by name. And that was how I met Michael Foley, who was, he and I joined together to, to take the Honest Obstermann into its next sort of uh, phase. So, and the, the other thing that happened on the same day, it was, it was, it was some day when I think, <laughs> on the same day, Amy invited me to join the writers group that met in his house. And... Uh, I didn't attend it all, all that often, but I attended enough to meet friends. Uh, up to that point, I hadn't really known anybody who was a writer. I mean, uh, some of the names I knew, but I'd never actually met any of them. Uh, but suddenly, I became aware of the, the English Society of Queens, for example, which is a tremendously active, writing, uh, an amazing range of Irish, American, Welsh, Scottish poets and so on, you know, coming over and doing readings. And uh, then everybody going for a pint or two afterwards, you know, it was, a, it was just a terrific feel to that particular period. You know, it was, for anybody interested in poetry, there was a definite kind of excitement to, uh, in the air. Uh, I can remember going to somebody's flat after the uh, English Society and uh, meeting somebody called Karen Carson <laughs> and uh, thinking to myself, God, I liked him, you know, and, uh, I wouldn't mind having a conversation with him and, and uh, he seems to have felt the same and, you know, he, uh, that was one of the things that uh, emerged from that particular group. It wasn't just poets either, I mean, uh, Bernard McLaughlin was there reading his various short stories. Stuart Parker was there reading extracts from his plays. Uh, Arthur Terry, who was a professor of Spanish, was there working away on uh, translations from the Catalan. <laughs> amazing, amazing sort of literary ferment that yes. must have given a great impetus to your own work and confirm the path you wanted to, to go on with all of those people you were able to spark off? Oh yes, yeah, and I think also 
people tend to uh, exchange notes about the books they've been reading, you know, or borrow books from them. And uh, it, was, it was very rich in that respect as well, you know. Yeah. So, of course, that, that time then led into the period of the Troubles, and um, which was, again, a time of great literary ferment, lots of um, writing coming out of that. But um, you mean, you've written really interestingly about um, some of the dilemmas that the, the Troubles gave to writers, and particularly in your introduction to A Rage for Order, which is an anthology of of um, troubles, of poetry um, written at the time of the troubles and about the troubles. I mean, did you feel a kind of moral or a social obligation to, you know, either write about those topics or write in a certain way about them? I think my attitude was that uh, if, if the poems came on about that subject, I would stick with them and write them. You know, that, uh, wouldn't be a deliberate choice. It would just be if, uh, if, if poems on that subject kind of uh, pressed forward to be expressed in some kind of way, uh, I'm willing to do that. There was quite a lot of debate among writers at that time, you know, about whether they should write about the trouble at all. Um, and there were certainly there were critics who uh, would accuse you of exploiting the trouble, troubles by writing about them, you know. Um, and there were other people who felt that uh, you were sort of shirking your duty as a poet if you didn't write about uh, the trouble. Didn't get it right? Well, this, this debate tended to uh, happen in the pages of the Honest Ultraman as well as the last day. The Honest Ultraman tended to express itself in matters, basically, than uh, anywhere else. I mean, um, the other interesting thing you've said about that, that dilemma about, you know, if you if you write about it, are you being exploitative or if you don't write about it, are you being evasive? Um, but you were you were saying that this preoccupation that writers had about how to respond was actually quite enabling in a way, which was which was interesting. It didn't paralyze them. It, it actually spurred them on in a way. Well, yes, I'm uh, saying things that come to mind as we talk about this are statements, but there was a statement by Amy, and she said that uh, troubles are here. Uh, one of the first duties of a poet is to find images and symbols adequate to our predicament. I think that's what I put it. And you know that, <coughs> so, so that he, he envisaged writing poetry as a sort of search by the poet for adequate or appropriate ways of, of writing about the troubles. Michael Longley, I think, in an interview or not, he said something very similar, you know, he said that uh, if, you, if you didn't respond to what was happening in your community, you weren't much of a poet, really. But, uh, uh, but they also felt that uh, what was happening should be allowed to find its sort of artistic depth before the poet. So, so the board didn't just, just sort of leap in there and, and, and start writing about it. That had to be a very considered process. And you've written a <clears throat> very good poem um, yourself, um, of Apple's Normandy, 1944, which reflects some of that, uh, you know, ambivalent relationship between an artist and uh, war. And I wondered if you would maybe read that one for us. Yes, I wrote a poem called Albums Norman in 1944. It was part of a sequence of poems that uh, I wrote about the spring of 1944 in the north of Ireland, when the whole place was like an armed camp, because it was full of soldiers who were preparing for the Normandy landings. Enormous numbers of Polish and English uh, soldiers, but particularly American GIs. And, uh, I mean, obviously, by the time I was born, the war was more or less uh, over. But there were a lot of stories about the Americans in particular. They, they seem to have got on particularly well with the nationalist and Catholic community. Um, and uh, 
I found myself writing a sequence or trying to write a sequence of poems about their experience, imagining their experience, you know, before they left America, while they were in the north of Ireland, during the Normandy, the fighting in Normandy, and then the survivors who returned to America at the end. So it was about 30 or 35 uh, poems. Once it started, it, it started galloping, you know, the trouble keeping up. There was something extremely exciting about that because I suppose usually if you're writing poems, you write a poem and work on it and maybe two, two or three months you're still working on it. But this this sort of more, more or less happened on a daily basis, you know, that one poem just led on naturally to another. Uh, the Apple's Normandy poem, 1944, is, I suppose, it, it's the sort of poem about an American war artist who, uh, you know, has got a certain official role, um, but who very gradually gets fed up with this uh, role and is anxious to sort of uh, devote his skills and so on to to writing about something simple and straightforward like apples. And uh, it's just, it's the poem is written in a kind of tone of exasperation, I suppose, with people on the outside kind of forcing you to or, or trying to dictate to you what the subject of your poem should be, you know. So it was very much about, not just about uh, American GIs, but also about the attitudes of poets in the north of Ireland to, the various criticisms that were put their way. Apples, Normandy, 1944. Was it D plus 10 or D plus 12? We caught the war artist sketching apples. I'm sick of tanks, he said. I'm sick of ruins. I'm sick of dead soldiers and soldiers on the move and soldiers resting. And to tell you the truth, I'm sick drawing refugees. I want to draw apples. For all we know, he's still sitting under a tree somewhere between the Seine and the Omaha, or russet with pleasure, striding past old dugouts towards the next windfall. Sketchbooks accumulating as he becomes the Audubon of French apples, or works on a single apple, perfect geometry of his imagination. Uh, I remember being really pleased as somebody somebody wrote me a letter out of the blue and said, I wonder if you were thinking about the artist so and so. Uh, this were you? What? And were you thinking of that particular artist? Really, no, I didn't the name the, the artist's name was completely new to me, but uh, okay. just kind of that's another kind of endorsement there really, you know, that it, it was it was alive enough for me that other readers' eyes, you know, they made them really need to be think of a specific uh, war artist. Yeah. Absolutely. It's an amazing poem. <clears throat> um, can we want to move on a wee bit to your sort of you know, what your creative technique is? Uh, you know, how do you start a poem? Do you have a particular form or meter in mind? Is it is it something that's going on around you? Like we're, you know, that we're talking about the, the troubles, but does it start with an idea or a um, subject or a phrase in your case? It, it can happen in any of those uh, ways. I, I think that uh, I'm happiest if, uh, if it occurs to me in the form of an image, an image of some kind. Um, and also, it's good if you have a line. I mean, sometimes the poem occurs to you as a line. Very often it's the first line. Very often it turns out to be the first line. No, 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 not doesn't necessarily have to be. And uh, then I suppose it begins to sort of uh, accumulate. And very quickly, I think, you have a sense of whether you're going to use rhyme, for example, or not. Uh, whether you're going to write it in quatrains or it's going to be free verse or I mean, in a way, the emergence of the poem and the gradual emergence of the poem uh, almost makes those decisions for you, you know. Um, um, 
I'm always slightly nervous about being asked to write a poem on something that I've been having a poem commissioned, you know, and the uh, BBC used to do this, uh, you know, they'd say we're putting together a program of Christmas poems, you know, I mean, any Christmas poems <laughs> that haven't been published, it, it meant that you had to sit down and think of a Christmas poem, you know, and uh, although I've written under those, that sort of instruction. I've never really been satisfied with the end product. You know, it always it always rings a bit more perspiration than inspiration, as they say. Yes, it hasn't come from you. It's come from an outside <clears throat> commission in that case. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, um, you've edited other poets' work, such as John Hewitt, for example. Um, I mean, working on that um, an anthology or collection of his work, um, did that change your own writing? Did that give you insights into his technique that came across? Up to a point. Um, I mean, he himself very much believed in the idea of a poet serving a kind of apprenticeship, you know, not necessarily in, with a, not necessarily helped by other poets, but just through through reading, for example, discovering the work of poets that you liked, and, and sort of reading up on them. That, that, that always seemed to me to be a rich, a rich possible beginnings for poems. Um, And in um, when you're placing poems together, um, you, either in an anthology or in your own collections, what you know, what or, what order do you put them in? How do you? Um, is there a way of doing it so that they add up to more than the sum of the parts? Um, it was very interesting doing a thematic anthology, uh, which was the format for a uh, uh, range for order, because. No, you know, in, in thematic sections, so you were deliberately choosing poems, or one could say there's one section which is about casualties and, uh, and various atrocities and so on. And uh, within that section, you would find yourself placing certain poems side by side because that's how it's sort of occurred to you when you look down, you know, at the I can see that these poems have something in common. Uh, that they should be placed side by side. Um, I enjoyed doing that because um, it struck me that that was almost as important a kind of creative function as, as writing for, you know, placing people's work in such a way to show it off to its best advantage. You know, and, uh, um, and, uh, I mean, it is one of the, the great things that, as well as your own writing, you know, you've been you've been an important editor of literary magazine, Aldous Dulsterman. You've been this highly successful teacher of English literature, prolific editor, compiler of poetry anthologies, and the work of other poets and writers. So, you know, you've facilitated and nurtured all of these other writers as well. What what's been behind that in terms of what you've been wanting to achieve through doing that? I I don't think I ever consciously thought of myself as, as some kind of impresario of Ulster Court or whatever. I mean, I could see looking back on it through the hindsight, uh, you can see all that, and lots of people. I've said very nice things about that. <laughs> and uh, um, so I felt that uh, consciously or unconsciously I'd, I'd been doing something very useful, you know, uh, keeping the magazine going for 20 years for the campus. You know, <laughs> quite a rare sort of thing. You know. Magazines generally spring up. Two issues appear and then they collapse. <laughs> That's wonderful. Absolutely. And um, yes, they, they mean the honest Osterman sort of gave the first or early kind of opportunity to a, a lot of great writers to yeah. get their work published and was sort of hugely 
influential. Um, obviously, you, my own husband, Robert Johnson, and you edited together for quite a few years, and, and you had a, a major impact in my life by, by introducing me to my future husband as well. Uh, the best one I've ever written. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Well, it, it was um, a pretty dramatic influence to have in somebody's life. And I turned up looking for work experience at your door when you were uh, running the Old Stolstermen and you sent me to Fortnight because I'd said I didn't care much about earning money. And that was the day that I, I met Robert. So um, I have a lot to be grateful to you for, for that. <laughs> Robert and I were a very sure birthday. Thirty of October. Absolutely, my goodness. Yes, part of birth. <laughs> Twins. <laughs> um, but no, you're, you're, I mean, you've had a huge influence, um, you know, and still do on, on the, the sort of Northern Ireland poetry scene and beyond. Um, and because by, you know, choosing poems to include in an anthology and uh, curating others' work, um, that's, that's such a sort of um, important influence to have. Were, were you always sure of your own judgment in doing that? Because it's it's a, quite a responsibility to have as well. Yes. I, I don't know that I was always entirely confident in, in judgment about it, but at the same time, you know, when you have a magazine together, so you, you are forced to select what you thought was the, the best material. If there was something you could say to a young poet about, ways in which you might improve this poem. Uh, I mean, uh, I did that in some circumstances. Uh, if, if there was a really obvious example, you know, uh, you'd say to somebody, you, you're not going to be a better poem if you just lost the last verse completely. You know? <laughs> Why did they take that? Did they take that well or not so much? Some didn't, some didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, for editing purposes, that's one of the best forms of editing that you can have, shortening the poem. The poem ends up considerably shorter than it was at the beginning. You've probably done something good. <laughs> and uh, another piece of advice I would sometimes give was, um, you know, are there, is there a particular image? Where is a particular line in this manuscript poem that you're really proud of, you know, that you think it's the best thing in the poem to set it aside and prepare to jettison it. <laughs> I mean, the other the other thing I notice, which comes through a lot, is that the sort of profundity of quite small things. Um, I was thinking about your series of poems about the rain barrel um, in the book of the same name, which is a sort of elevation of the everyday to kind of epic heights. Um, where you've got the life cycle of this of this rain barrel that almost becomes like a member of the family. Yeah. Um, and I don't just what was the process you went through in kind of conceiving of a sequence like that? That one came as a bit of a surprise to me, I have to say. You know, I've written a couple of poems about the rain barrel. And it didn't it didn't ignite or it didn't catch fire in the same way that a northern spring did, you know, which uh, had me galloping along almost from point to point. Um, it, it was a while before I recognised that the, the rain bar was going to turn into a sequence, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed writing at that particular sequence. You know. It's a, it's a brilliant sequence. I really recommend it to people that haven't read it. Um, reminded me a wee bit of the um, uh, Patrick Kavanagh and Kerr's ass, you know, about the god of imagination and waking in a mucker fog. It, it has that, that kind of the, the, the banal and the everyday and then this extraordinary thing emerges from it. There's also, there's also a poem in the book about fun yard buckets. Yes. Different types of buckets. <laughs> a new subject my Irish poet in it. <laughs> I know, I never look at buckets or or indeed a rain barrel the same way again, I think. And are you writing much yourself at the moment? Are there any forthcoming publications we can look forward to? Well, I thought I had another book, more or less. But when I looked at the material again, closely I thought there's really only about half of it. 
And uh, also, I haven't written home since March. More, more I stopped writing about March and uh, didn't know where it was going to come from. Weirdly, it came this morning. <laughs> it came this morning from, um, I was reading an interview by, I don't know if you ever, I was, uh, I was looking through it and there was a, a question. There was a question about uh, my, my father and how to treat my father and so on. Um, and uh, in answering the question, I suddenly realized when I reread the answer to the question that the answer was actually a poem. Yeah. You know, it, uh, and I, I, I never noticed, I have never noticed this before, but, but there it was, and very simple and straightforward. And we go for a walk, puts his hand on my shoulder, my mother feeds it, my mother gives him his insulin injections by feeding his mind. And it was just completely. It's like a fine poem of your own making. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, well, that's the start of another father sequence that I don't know, but it might. Fantastic. Well, we hope you do. That that could be the spark you need to <laughs> get you back into it again. Be, you know, I, I was actually sorry that I hadn't held on to the um, disappeared poem. And made a book out of They're they're so strong. They're so great. Absolutely. Well, maybe there's more where that came from oh, as well. Possibly, uh, there were about eleven of them or something like that. I'm sure they didn't start. Yeah. Um, I I should say as well that the um the Irish Cultural Centre is partnering with No Alibis Bookshop in in Belfast for this event. So. If you are interested in buying one of Frank's recent books that we've been talking about today, such as The Rain Barrel or The Darkness of Snow or Goat's Milk, um, and at a discount as well, uh, mm -hmm. you can visit the um, ICC website for further details. Um, so, so Frank, we're sort of, you know, coming to the end of, of this um, conversation now, but I mean, we've talked about what an extraordinary life and what extraordinary output as well in terms of all these marvellous poems and anthologies. So you, you look back across all of that, hopefully there's a lot more to come, but what's the, what's the achievement that gives you greatest pleasure when you think back on it? I think that the sense of achievement is strongest when you have finished poem, which you think might be among your best poems. And of course, the one you always think is among your best poems is the last one you've written. <laughs> um, and um, I had written a poem which appeared in the Yorker. It was called The Butterfly Hunt. It's in the it's in the the rainbow, and uh, I just had some sort of sense of that. Of that. Was certainly one of the best things I've ever done. We're really proud of this particular. <laughs> so, would you be able to uh, to read us the butterfly house in that case? Butterfly house. One more butterfly in the butterfly house will count as overcrowding. Sun all morning and the heaviness of piped heat draws hundreds to the surface. They spend their days being exquisite in a history without wars. We are able briefly to forget the scaly intent, the cold skin slither a hundred yards away in the tropic of the moon. Hold up your arm. And with luck, you will emerge into the garden, badged and sleeved with butterflies, a thousand bright sails opening around you. Fantastic. I can see why you've chosen that one. I'm going to keep liking it. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, 
Brilliant. Well, listen, Frank, it's been a total pleasure to have this conversation with you this afternoon. And thank you so much for doing it. Um, more power to you. And um, given that, you know, there's a new poem has emerged this morning, I hope there's lots more brilliant poems to come in the future. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.